have we witnessed the high a watermark for immigration globally? And so it's, it's, it's useful just to take stock and, and figure out where exactly we are. Uh, in the US, you have about 15% of the population that is foreign born, Canada, 22%, Australia, 29%. Um, you've got Gulf states, United Arab Emirates at 88%. Uh, and then throughout Europe, we're kind of in the, um, the low double digits. So we've seen pretty significant increases in immigration over the last 20 years, not quite as dramatic as the increase in trade as a share of GDP that Paul showed. And we still only have 3.3% of the world's population living in a country other than the one in which they were born. Um, but uh, we have witnessed uh, the largest increase in global labor flows in more than a century uh, 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 in the last 20 years. So in thinking about what COVID might do, uh, first thing I'd, I'd like to do is just kind of quickly run through uh, what, do we, what do we know about what immigration actually does to the global economy? Uh, and I wanna highlight uh, four things here. Um, first is that immigration moves labor uh, from low to high productivity countries. Second, within countries, immigrants tend to be footloose and help address spatial misallocation issues. Uh, third, um, uh, the global mobility of labor allows us to more fully exploit agglomeration economies. And fourth, something we don't spend nearly enough time talking about is that immigration represents a form of insurance uh, against very severe shocks related to famine, pestilence, uh, and war. Um, the, um, uh, and so we know any model is going to give you quite substantial global welfare gains uh, from, from immigration. The optimality of immigration uh, uh, of those flows uh, depends very much on what tax systems uh, look like. Um, and COVID uh, certainly threatens these gains. So just giving you some evidence on each of these mechanisms, what do we know about this, uh, uh, the impact of, uh, of immigration on, um, on uh, labor productivity? Well, for the typical country moving from um, home to say the US, you increase income and therefore reflected productivity by somewhere between three and seven times. Uh, so these, the, uh, this is a, a very efficient way of addressing spatial misallocation issues uh, globally. A substantial share of those income gains are shared with, with members at home. If we look at high remitting countries, uh, what we see is a bunch of places where remittances are between 10 and 20% of GDP. Um, what the IMF and the World Bank are, are forecasting for this year is a reduction in global remittances around uh, 20%. So if you're a Honduras or an El Salvador, um, this is gonna be a very severe shock uh, to your economy. Um, third, uh, um, in thinking about uh, spatial misallocation inside countries, what does immigration do? Uh, here I'm citing work by uh, Kadena and Kovac, uh, looking at the, um, the excess mobility of immigrants to local labor demand shocks, uh, which helps deal with differences in unemployment rates across regions uh, uh, within countries. Um, then uh, thinking not just about um, the, what you, the uh, static gains from immigration in terms of addressing uh, long run differences in, um, in, in labor productivity. There's also a sense in which uh, uh, immigration plays a very important role in the global innovation uh, process. When we think about innovation, um, a lot of that innovation happens in the United States and, a lot, and, and immigration plays a central role in that. And I wanna highlight three features of that. First on uh, the worker side, if we look at occupations um, that account for a disproportionate share of the patents produced in the last 20 years, what you see is that immigrants are kind of over 40% of the labor force. Um, when uh, we look at those with advanced degrees and over 20% of the labor force when we look at those with just uh, a BA. When we then look at uh, the movement of inventors, so now narrowing our focus on the individuals who, who generate patents, uh, and where do they go? They overwhelmingly go uh, uh, to the United States. Um, how do they get here? Many of them get here by virtue of uh, the education system. And what we've seen um, at, uh, at the BA level, but much more dramatically at the graduate level is substantial increases in the share of foreign uh, students um, in what we do. So at the, for in, in master's granting institutions, the foreign born uh, now account for about 18% of students um, and for PhD granting programs, it's 13% and for BA programs, uh, it's 5%. Um, 
Finally, um, something we don't talk enough about uh, in, uh, when, when considering immigration, uh, it plays an important role in allowing individuals to flee violence or other, uh, persecution uh, or other very adverse shocks. Uh, this slide just shows you in the top um, where uh, homicide rates have peaked in Guatemala, uh, Honduras, and El Salvador, and in the bottom, where did uh, young people leave from who then sought asylum uh, uh, in the United States? So as we then you know, take stock and, and think about, well, what is COVID going to do here? You know, Paul makes a very good point in that the, the, the impact on the stocks might not be that substantial. People are where they are. Uh, and there's a relatively small number of people who will be forced to return home uh, of that 3.3% of, that of the global population that are where they are, relatively a small share would be forced, forced to go home. But what I wanna highlight is that the disruption in the flows, even though that's a small share of the total, can have a quite substantial impact on important parts of the economy, in particular when it comes uh, to innovation. So think about, uh, if you want to imagine it like this, that the U.S. innovation ecosystem um, uh, relies enormously on immigration. Uh, first, we, uh, we attract students to the United States, um, and we've, uh, we've uh, severely disrupted this, not just by the rules that were put in place this week, but the U.S. has pulled consular staff out of consulates and embassies worldwide, so you can't get an interview uh, to get a visa. Um, second, uh, those graduates then uh, go on to get um, OPT or H-1B visas, which you can view as something like a, a, a training ground um, as, they, as they try out for jobs uh, uh, with U.S. Uh, companies. Um, the uh, U.S. has essentially uh, shut down um, the provision of these visas, at, at least for the, time, for the time being. And then after that period of, of, of a tryout phase, what do we have is the uh, after being on an H-1B visa that your employer decides to sponsor you for uh, a green card, and we have new restrictions that are complicating uh, uh, the process here. So what we have um, is at the current time is, is the imposition of a quite severe COVID tax on the movement of foreign students, foreign workers, uh, and, and business travel. Uh, and because that those flows are quite central to how these agglomerated areas where innovation happens operate, um, we have the, the potential here to disrupt global patterns of industry agglomeration, at least when it comes uh, to where uh, uh, innovation happens. And this is going to uh, force firms to, to think of, uh, of two strategies. One is just to regionalize innovation uh, in the way that they might regionalize supply chains. Um, or simply uh, agglomerate uh, elsewhere. Uh, the U.S. faces competition in terms of where university students might go. Um, the, uh, the U.K., Canada, and Australia have uh, taken a big bite out of global market shares and are now, if the U.S. keeps its uh, restrictions in place, are primed to capture a larger share of that higher education market. That matters for innovation and where innovation happens because that's, that's the training grounds. The tech companies recruit from, uh, from those universities uh, to fill out uh, uh, their labor force. So I don't know where things are gonna go here and it's, and it's way too early in the process uh, to understand. We do know that as of right now, that COVID tax on immigration is very large. Um, it's prohibitive in a number of senses. Um, and so as we think about future flows and we think about the, the, the hiring process, we can get reagglomeration in certain activities that could be quite substantial. Now, in terms of the share of the labor force, we aren't talking about big numbers, but if we're thinking about where productivity gains happen, this could be quite important for the US. Globally, you know, it's, it's hard to say that this would have a substantial impact on, on US welfare, but if you're a property owner in the Bay Area, um, or if you're a US tech worker, then impacts on your livelihoods could be affected uh, uh, quite substantially. So there's a, we're set up for a very interesting experiment here, depending on how long this, uh, this, um, this tax lasts and, uh, and how responsive um, uh, firms are in terms of locating key parts of the uh, production chain uh, to that tax.